senior welding engineer in, and she's a senior welding engineer in welding engineer so uh, regarding her she has worked with two of the greatest engineering projects in the next decade putting humans on mars and completion of the world's first commercial tokamak fusion reactor so we are having her today with us she is a well process expertise and lot of application experiences and uh, many first of the kind uh, welding technology she has bought in uh, north america and she has four weld patterns to her name and she is the author of three uh, books in welding and also uh, a lot of technical papers published by her and uh, she wrote a laser plasma oxy fuel in american uh, society metal book ninth edition and she also invented the pocket welder the world's first hand size electronic weld steel unit which is today being sold by aws so uh, emily we are totally privileged, privileged to have you today and uh, without wasting much of our time we are handing over the session to you I mean, you can share your screen and the rights are with you. Well, it's, it's eight o'clock in the morning here. <laughs> I guess it's 5.30 in India, and there are people in different countries. Can you hear me, everybody, I hope? Yeah, it, it's very clear. It's very clear. You have to forgive my raspy voice. I had a bout of cancer this year and a lot of radiation in my throat area, so um, bear, bear with me. I'm going to cover today something called process controls, which is something very rare in the welding industry. And I'm going to go through the MIG process, GMA process, which is, accounts for over 80% of the wells in this industry, and show you how, at the end of the day, it's really, really a simple process. One or two settings is all you need. And at the end of the day, uh, I hope at the end of this session that you'll be able to go back to your welding shops and instantly set the correct parameters for any MIG weld. I'm going to call it MIG because that's, we sell MIG equipment and MIG gases. So uh, we'll call it, keep calling it MIG today. The, the welding industry in general is focused on welding skills and still does today in North America and around the world. And um, never talks about process controls, very rare. And um, it's once you understand process controls, it makes selecting weld equipment, weld transfer modes, weld wires, gas mixes. It gives you the ability to always make sure you've got maximum productivity. And it's a very easy method for working out weld costs. We're a, what I call a play around industry. MIG has been around now since the 1950s. And yet at the end of the day, uh, in North America or Germany or Italy, wherever you go in the world, people are playing around with the two controls on the MIG equipment. And it's been that way since stick welding in the 1920s to people in robot cells today still playing around with the weld controls. It should be a big issue, well controls, because at the end of the day, there's no good spending money on robots unless you optimize the robot weld quality and productivity. It doesn't make any sense. And yet there are very few individuals that are programming robots understand how to get to the maximum productivity potential from the robot. In MIG welding, <clears throat> we need to learn three different types of transfer, short circuit, spray, and pulsed. You may be just using pulsed, but at the end of the day, when you go into it, or you may have a regular CV machine, just a regular MIG machine, but when you go into a robot cell today, typically it's going to have a pulsed unit attached to it. But it also has a CV mode, 
So you have a machine there basically capable of three different well transfers, and they can each provide different solutions to different problems. So when you learn this stuff, not only can you help your company, but you're also helping yourself in your career prospects because the ability to walk into a robot cell anywhere in the world and provide an instant solution is a very important thing. Let's start off with all the fancy welding equipment and electronics and circuit boards as mentioned. The regular MIG equipment that's been developed for the last 50, 60, sometimes 70 years is more than capable of doing perfect wells. And at the end of the day, it's a different type of equipment from pulsed. So CV equipment, different slopes, you know, and a different energy. Spray is very different energy from pulsed. But all I'm saying to you, no matter where you are in the world, in Africa or India or Canada or someplace or here in the US, when you walk up to that little MIG machine in the corner there, that's not changed in 50 years, it's more than capable of producing perfect welds, as this weld here was done only a week ago um, with a regular CV MIG machine. So when you have this expertise, which we're going to get into in a minute, you now have the ability to actually evaluate MIG equipment for your MIG and flux cord welds. You now have the ability to understand the transfer modes and their requirements. And you have the ability to, with any weld, always attain maximum weld productivity and quality. If I was to go into your plants today, whether it's in India or in the US, and I asked 10 welders to increase the weld heat, <coughs> some of them would adjust the voltage, some of them would adjust the wire feed. If I ask 10 welders to set the spray transfer point with a 1.2 millimeter wire, I would normally just get a glazed look. This is not acceptable with a process that's been around for 70 years with two controls, a process that accounts every day around the world for about 80% of the world's wells. We're an industry therefore that plays around with controls, that often relies on sales advice. And if you're, you know, everybody makes different equipment and they sell different gas mixes and different wires. So if you're a, we are a technical industry. And if we have to keep relying on sales advice, some perhaps sometimes it may be a little biased and, and, and unnecessary. But in welding equipment today now, we have so many different power sources with so many different bells and whistles that all this is doing at the end of the day is adding to the confusion in the welding shops. We have weld equipment today now that you can pay up to $20,000 or you can pay $5,000. And I can assure you at the end of the day, I can take the $5,000 machine and make any weld that the $20,000 machine can and do it a lot more quickly and with a couple of two or three settings. Electronics, of course, have a place in welding, particularly in robot cells. But at the end of the day, the welding shop environment, you know, uh, some of the welding equipment from the 60s and 70s is still around in the welding shops today. It's easy to repair and it's low cost. So the message here to everybody is, Let's forget about the salesmanship of welding equipment for a while, and let's just focus on what we can do with what we have. Because around the world right now, as we speak, there are millions of welding shops that have regular MIG equipment and that can't afford to pay $20,000 for a MIG machine. Something ironically you're going to learn here today is the low cost equipment with the spray mode in most instances can do a superior quality weld than a pulse weld if you're looking at welding fusion. And you know, at the end of the day, welding fusion is the most important thing in a weld. And I'll explain this as we get into it. 
<laughs> so we have regular MIG equipment now that's been sold, as I said. I've been doing this for 60 years. So you know, I started in the 60s and I can remember, you know, the power sources from Lindy uh, in the 60s and Echo and, 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 and Lincoln and Miller and Hobart power sources. And it wouldn't matter to me today if I was welding with a power source from the 60s or one of these CV regular MIG power sources today. But I want you to no notice on all these power sources and when you go back to your shops, you won't see any information on where to set the voltage. And that's what the power source control is going to do is provide the voltage. When you look on the wire feeder, you won't see where to set the wire feeder, which is ironic if you think about this industry and this process, there are only two or three settings required once you put a 0.9 or a 1.2 millimeter wire, steel or stainless wire on your MIG equipment. So the power source provides the voltage and the voltage and the power source provides the current which basically melts the wire. But we don't have a conductor. That conductor is going to be in the wire. The power source basically delivers open circuit voltage when you switch it on. But when the arc starts, the power source then delivers weld voltage. Weld voltage on robot pendants is sometimes called trim or arc length control. The wire feed units simply provide the conductor, the conductor for the current from the power source. Again, you'll notice on a wire feed, a typical control is the miller on the bottom there that you see just a knob, but never any information on it. We're going to simplify this today and put information that should have been there 50 years ago. Wire feeds control the weld energy that you're going to get as long as the voltage from the power source is big enough to provide that energy. The wire feed is going to create the weld transfer mode. It'll be low settings for short circuit, moderate settings for pulsed, high settings for spray. The wire feed is the most important, and I want all of you people that are involved in quality to here to remember this point. The wire feed is the most important part of a MIG well procedure because it's the only constant. Voltage is up and down, you know, this pulse power source does this, the CV power source does this, a little different current provides them, maybe pulsing. Wire feed is a constant. So the most critical thing that you always check in a MIG procedure is the wire feed. It's going to control not only the energy, the current from the power source, it's going to control the travel speed, which controls the fusion, which controls the joules input, the energy input. So, I've been writing about this now for 30, 40 years. Nobody's been listening, but at the end of the day, there are only two settings. And I'm going to show you in this session, the two MIG session, the two settings that you can weld every application in the world with right now. So the wire feed basically delivers in inches per minute, typically on meters per minute. It delivers current, it delivers the deposition rate for speed, which controls deposition rate is travel rate, and speed controls weld energy. Wire feed rate determines the voltage that is going to be required from the power source. And each weld transfer mode, short circuit, short circuit pulsed, or spray, requires a certain amount of wire feed, which we're going to learn here today. 
Now this wire feed here, just like that Miller machine, I've set it at the 10 o'clock position. But I think there's four or 500 people out there possibly listening to this workshop. I have no idea right now. If I asked anyone, what does that mean? I don't think I would have an answer. For those of you putting the hands up, you have to write your questions down because I'm going through 75 slides here. I will try and get to questions at the end. It depends if I can make it in the two hour period. The wire feed set at 10 o'clock. What does it actually mean? We all like to call ourselves well professionals. But at the end of the day, a professional understands the tools they work with, the processes they work with. And if MIG welding is the world's number one process and you don't completely understand that process, then unfortunately you're not a well professional. These are simple questions. What's the wire feed start point for spray with a, a one or a, a 1.2 millimeter wire? Do you know how to instantly set the optimum wire feed? Uh, for a pulse spray fillet, as, as, as a, 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 a six millimeter fillet. With that 0.9 millimeter wire, one millimeter wire, what's the wire feed, optimum wire feed and voltage for a common 16 or 14 gauge steel weld? These are, these are things that we shouldn't even have to think about. We should be aware of because these are common applications six millimeter fillets, 16 gauge, 1.6 millimeter sheet metal wells, the most common wells in the world. And yet when we come to the MIG welding process, the minute we start asking questions, we typically like to say what I often say on LinkedIn, we get a lot of bovine fecal matter or we get a lot of silence. So many years ago, in the late 80s, early 90s, I started to look at this important process because I used to ask questions like everybody else did and I never got the answers. I started off welding in 1961 in Massey Ferguson, all the welding machines were set. And when you ask the supervisors or the engineers, can I make changes or how do you set these machines? Most of them just walked away. So I decided, there are not that many settings on this wire feed. So surely we may be able to find the common denominator, the optimum settings. And I developed something called the clock method. And the reason it's called the clock method is because that control on the wire feeder, if you look at it, it really goes from seven o'clock to five o'clock. Well, if you were looking at your clock right now from seven o'clock to five o'clock, you would see 10 settings. 12 o'clock is the fifth turn. Five o'clock is the 10th turn. If you look at the average wire feeder sold around the world, they're typically zero to 800 inches a minute. But on average, for example, Miller equipment, the wire feeders are 700 inches a minute. And most wire feeders are in that range, 700 inches a minute. So we have 10 settings. Well, it's just like the first turn is 70 inches a minute. 10 into 700 is 70. The fifth turn, which is the 12 o'clock position, is five times 70 is 350. The 10th setting basically is um, at the five o'clock is 10 times 70 is 700 inches a minute. So right now what I've done is I've taken that wire feeder and divided it into 10 segments, each one 70 inches per minute. It doesn't really matter if your wire feeder is 650 inches a minute or 800 inches a minute. In this clock method, 
I'm going to provide the sweet spots, the optimum short circuit sweet spot, where the most short circuits take place in a second, the optimum spray, the optimum pulse. And because it's the sweet spot, it means there's adjustment either side of it. So it doesn't really matter if it's 650 or 800 inches a minute. I'm taking 700 inches a minute as the average. For those of you that have got metric on your wire feeders, typically maybe in meters per minute, it's just two meters per minute per turn. The fifth, the 12 o'clock setting is the fifth turn. Five times two is 10 meters per minute. So if you walked up to a standard wire feeder and put it at 12 o'clock, it's 10 meters per minute. If it's a, in inches per minute, as Lincoln and Miller is in, in America, it's the fifth turn is five times 70 is 350 inches a minute. So I'm starting to get some very valuable information here now. You see in the bottom left-hand corner, we have a Lincoln control there. If I was normally doing a weld with an 035 and a, an 0.9 millimeter wire and welding quarter inch, a six millimeter fillet, I would normally have it set at the three o'clock position, which is the eighth turn. Eight times 70 is 560, eight times two meters is 16 meters per minute. So I can take this clock and remember that, you know, oh, I'm normally at the three o'clock position. I can go over to the digital feeder at the bottom and just put uh, 560 and dial that in there. Or I can go to a robot pendant and put 560 in. You're going to learn, as I said, there's only one or two settings here. I'm showing you the clock method right now and showing you that it's applicable to regular wire feed, the wire feeds that provide the uh, the digital wire, the, the, the robot cell pendant, it's all relevant. So each of the well transfer modes we talked about, short circuit, spray and pulse, has two wire feed and bolt settings. And that's what we're going to learn now. Short circuit is a very, very unique process because the arc is going on and off. Pulse, the arc is on all the time. It just transfers droplets. So short circuit can be very, very, very beneficial on, on gauge metals. And you've seen today uh, with Miller RMD, it's just basically a modified short circuit mode. If you don't have a Miller RMD to weld a root pipe and you rotating your pipes on a low cost rotary positioner, you can just set a short circuit weld and put a root pass in on a pipe all day long and never have a problem. So this, is a, this process short circuit is ideal for metals that are less than 2.8 millimeters, less than 100 pounds available on any low cost MIG machine anywhere in the world. The settings I'm going to provide for short circuit. Now here's an interesting thing. If I'm welding 16 gauge, 1.6 millimeter sheet metal, in MIG welding, I, I normally need about 140 amps. If I pulse weld, 16 gauge sheet metal. I normally need 140 amps. Because the well transfer modes change, the amount of weld energy that you can apply to a, a part relatively stays the same. You're not going to put a thousand amps into 1.6 millimeter steel. Therefore you need a specific required amount of amps to avoid burn through. So a lot of these settings that I'm going to talk about now 
are applicable also with Pulse. And we'll talk a little bit, we're going to talk about Pulse a little later on. So with short circuit, we have this arc on where there's energy generated and arc off where there's no energy generated. And that's what makes it unique. It's hot, cold, hot, cold. When it's set optimum, it delivers about a hundred short circuits per second. It creates that crackle sound. Each one of those short circuits creates an explosion. You've all heard it. That's a lot of short circuits taking place in a second, about a hundred times a second. So we have, we have other modes. We have unpulsed equipment today. Now you have low pulse modes. Now I will say this on sheet metals. With short circuit, the ideal wire size has always been 0.9 millimeter or 035 wire. It provides the optimum current range for all gauge metals. But when you change into a pulse setting, as we'll look later on, you can use an 045 wire. You don't need the same voltage because in short circuit, you need the voltage because the the wire keeps going on and off and on and off. So you need basically a higher voltage. So when I go to a 1.2 millimeter wire, I can also do very low settings with pulse. So pulse is also an excellent process, of course, on gauge metals. But at the end of the day, here's, here's something interesting and I'll repeat this. You can bring me right now the world's most sophisticated pulse power source and I can take the lowest cost power source, CB power source in the world and produce exactly the same quality on sheet metal wells as you do without spatter concerns. But we have what we have today. With sheet metal wells, we always got to remember, you know, a lap weld is the ideal preference because it doubles the thickness. A fillet weld or a butt weld in sheet metal adds to weld burn through potential. And you always have to remember with, sh with sheet metals, the number one issue is burning through, particularly with robots. The number one issue with wells on parts that are over two and a half, three millimeters is getting enough fusion. When we get to six millimeters and we do macros of fillet wells, in many instances, we'll see just marginal fusion. So we have two different things to always worry about. Sheet metal is burned through. Thicker metals is fusion. This is the short circuit wire feed range with a 0 0.9 or one millimeter wire. It runs basically from nine o'clock to just past 12 o'clock. I like to call this, when we work on sheet metals, this is the morning, these are the morning wells. Nine o'clock is the second turn, two times 70 is 140 inches a minute. 12 o'clock is the fifth turn. So it's basically running from round 150, let's say, to 350 inches a minute with that one millimeter wire. That's the whole short circuit range. So if I go into any sheet metal shop anywhere in the world and I have a MIG machine, I'll instantly set it at 10 o'clock. At that 10 o'clock setting, I'm going to get 140 amps. 140 amps is very suited to the world's most common sheet metal, which is 1.6 millimeter. If I need more heat, I'll go to 11 o'clock. If I need too hot, I'll go from uh, 10 o'clock to nine o'clock. Once I go past 12 o'clock, I no longer do short circuits, I create globular. So you can see right away, I'm giving you one piece of information right now that no matter where you go in the world, if you're going to be working on sheet metal, and it also applies on pulse, 
you will be somewhere around 10 o'clock. So if you walk into a robot cell and you're working on sheet metal, 10 o'clock is the third turn. Three times seven is 21. Three times 70 is 210 inches a minute. This is not rocket science. 10 o'clock, 140 amps. It's the sweet spot. It's the time if you put an oscilloscope on a short circuit world, you will see the maximum amount of short circuits have taken place. That, that's around 140 amps with a one millimeter wire. It's the sweet spot. You don't get any better than that. It doesn't create spatter. So if you're gonna start somewhere on sheet metal, start at the sweet spot. That short circuit amperage range is therefore typically, you know, forget the 80 amps, very few people well down there. It's typically one to 200 amps, one to 200 amps. So if all you ever do is weld sheet metal, a 200 amp power source is fine. But if you're going to weld over three millimeters, you better get that up to 250, 350, or 450 power source, amp power source. You can't get amps without voltage. Well, if you set your power source to actually deliver, not open circuit voltage, that's the voltage when you just switch the power source on, the voltage that when you hit that metal, and create an arc is actually showing 17 volts on the power source. Guess what? That's the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot, 17 volts. And the voltage range for short circuit is basically 15 to 20 volts. So if you're gonna start, if I, if I tell you something is 15 to 20 and you say, well, where do I start? Where the heck do you think you start? You start in the middle, 17, 18 volts. And I want you to remember that for the rest of your life because nothing's going to change. It's the way it's been for 70 years and it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll be the forever. So a great start voltage is 17 volts. So basically 16 gauge around 10 o'clock, 14 gauge, which is probably around about, uh, you know, one point, I don't know, 1.8 two millimeters. When you're getting around there, you're getting closer to 11 o'clock, 12 gauge, you're getting basically up to around about 100 foul. And then you shouldn't be in short circuit anymore. So you can see there, we go from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock, from 18 gauge to 12 gauge. We, that's majority of all the sheet metal wells in the world. So if you go into an automotive plant and you tell them I'm a great welder and they say, well, there's the robot, go set the robot wells to weld 14 gauge sheet metal. You remember that 16 gauge was 10 o'clock and 14 gauge is 11 o'clock and 11 o'clock is the fourth turn and four times 70 is 280 inches a minute. So you go to the robot pendant with your wire and it doesn't matter whether it's one millimeter or 1.2 and if you just put that 10 o'clock as a start position for example if you put that in you'll say yeah it's a little hot or whoa it's a little cold and you'll go up a turn and you'll go down a turn you've gone straight to the sweet spot you'll be very close wealth cost is one of the great mysteries of life you read all these articles in the welding magazines. Oh my God, it goes on and on. And you start to think you need to be a rocket scientist to work out weld costs. Weld costs are really quite simple. You pay this guy $10 an hour, it's $10 an hour. How much weld does he deliver in an hour? That's where the problem comes up because nobody knows. Well, that 0.9 wire delivers about a Never mind the 1.1, it delivers about a pound per turn. The 11 o'clock position, it would deliver, it's the fourth turn, delivers approximately 4.4 pounds. If that robot is basically welding for 30 minutes on the hour, 
it's only it's only putting down 2.2 pounds. If the welder welds, you know, uh, for 15 minutes on the hour, he's putting in a pound. Now you've got your well cost, cost of wire, whatever it is, and the cost of the gas is the wire and the gas typically associate for less than around on average 15 to 17 percent for the cost of a weld. And its deposition rate tells you how long you're going to have, how much wire you need, and how long are you going to be welding these parts. Wire feeds determine travel rate. The thinner the part is, the lower the wire feed setting is, because we don't want to burn through. So if I'm welding 18 gauge, with a, a one millimeter wire, I'm going to be 20, 25 inches a minute. But if I'm, if I really want fast welding speeds, it's better to weld 14 gauge or 12 gauge. And I can get that if I'm in short circuit still, because I can't go past 12 o'clock, I'll probably be at around 35, 40 inches a minute. So 20 to 40 inches a minute is normal in sheet metal wells. Don't have to remember that. Just remember 25 to 35 inches a minute is a normal sheet metal weld. So when you go back into that robot cell now and you have to put the welding speed in and you're welding 16 gauge, you would just start off around 30 inches a minute or 25 inches a minute. So I've given you so far quite a bit of data. If I'd started off and asked you to fill this information in, you would have just looked at me with a glaze. But now you can see, oh, that's the 10 o'clock position. It's the third turn. Oh, the 10 o'clock position delivers around 140 amps. Oh, to get 140 amps, I need 17 volts. Oh, around that 10 o'clock position, I should be welding 16 gauge. Oh, that 10 o'clock position is the third turn on that wire feeder. That's three pounds an hour. Oh, I'm welding sheet metal. I better start off at uh, 25, 30 inches a minute. So you see, you've learned a lot already. If we finish the session right now, you'd, you'd feel very comfortable welding sheet metals. I do want to remind you that although this, oh, I'm my time, I've got to really move a lot faster now. I'm, I'm talking too much. This session is two hours. This is part of a, a program that's 12 hours in length, but it deals with everything. It deals with rejects and rework and how to fix issues in the robot cells from a welding point of view. And it gives you far more information. I do have to move on a lot faster. So I'm good now. I, this is available. I've, I've said this can be recorded. If you, if you use this in your company and your company is not poor, then I expect you to come back and, and, and probably purchase it. I'll show you how to later on. If you yourself are a welding person and there's not much money in the company you work for, please record it and use it for your own use. So I'm going to go through a lot quicker now, emphasize on points, but it is available. It's going to be recorded. And I think your India chapter there will probably hopefully make it available to anybody that wants it. So short circuit again, and I'm emphasizing this on the clock. You start off at 10 o'clock, you need more heat, go to 11 o'clock, you need less heat, go to uh, nine o'clock. If you go up on the wire feed, add a bolt. If you go down on the wire feed, decrease a bolt. So every the old welding people talk about crackle sounds. Well, that crackle sound, the optimum sound, is coming at a 80 to 100 times per second. And that's around that 10 o'clock setting. What about spatter? Spatter is visual. You can see the spatter. You can hear the spatter. You can see sometimes with spatter different shapes and globules on the end of it. When I look at a robot like that, I know it can't be a short circuit weld because the energy is too high to create that spatter. Therefore, it's a poor spray weld with incorrect voltage. 
So it's a very visual thing, but to a lot of welders, it's just simply sound. I create what's called a spatter window. When I look at the weld on the left, that's a perfectly tuned voltage. As we create the correct voltage to wire feed, that spatter window is, is reduced. The weld on the right is a spray weld, but the wire is driving into the weld, making it cascade. And I know it's not a globular well because there's no globules on the end of the uh, spatter. So basically that weld on the right needs the voltage to go up to get the wire to come out of the weld. If you work in the correct voltage range, which short circuit typically is 16 to 19, less than 20 over 15, then you'll get that crackle sound. If the volts go too high, you'll get a plopping sound and you'll see droplets that's that's getting into globular if the if the sound is too low the wire is running into the weld um you need to turn the voltage up you'll hear a harsh crackle sound this describes and again i i, I won't go through it because you will have this available to you the different sounds welding sheet metals when you can weld vertical down when you can keep the contact tip outside the nozzle. Keep your wire stick out. This keeps your wire stick out short. But when you're welding, if you're getting to a burnt through spot, and again, with a robot, you can increase the wire stick out, which again, lowers the current. So with short circuit, whether you're using a pendant, 11 o'clock position. Remember, a robot can weld faster than a man. So if I started at 10 o'clock as a manual welder on sheet metal, I would go to 11 o'clock with the robot. 11 o'clock is the fourth turn. Fourth turn is four times seven is 280 inches a minute. I need that 17, 18 volts. I need that 25. There's my robot pendant speed right now to weld the majority of metals in every GM, Chrysler, and Ford plant in the world. That's just with short circuit. When I put robot data in, and, and this is where we go into why this program is really much more extensive. As you get into robots, you need start data, you need end data, but so many make the mistake of having poor start data and you get, you, you get it doesn't start, the arcs don't start, or you get burn back of the wire into the tip. And many people don't realize that the end data, sometimes if it's not correct, will create a globule on the, on, on the uh, wire, a droplet, which makes for a poor arc start. So bad end data makes for poor arc start data. If you notice here, my wire feed is three, 300, which is around 11 o'clock position. I'm using 19 volts. And I've, for the start, I've actually lowered it. I don't need uh all that wire running in at the start so i've lowered it down to two to the 10 o'clock position and i've kept the 19 volts which is in the short circuit range which will make sure i get a start and at the end i've reduced the wire feed and reduced the voltage so i've got good crater fill because that's all end data is on a robot it's not the weld end the end data is the crater fill data you just basically want a crater fill and that 17 volts will not create that drop on the end of the wire. And these are the issues that you get when you don't use the correct data. The data that's in these programs eliminates all these things from occurring. So then we've got, okay, we've got through short circuit there in about an hour. Now, all I want you to do now, remember right now, when you go back to your shops is try this, is remember 10 o'clock and 17, have 17 cups of coffee at 10 o'clock. I don't want you to remember 210 inches a minute or 140 amps. I just want you to remember 10 o'clock and 17 cups of coffee. Because I don't care whether you're in India or in, in America, you're probably gonna have some tea or coffee in the morning. And usually it's around 10 o'clock. If not, then you might wanna get another job. But 10 o'clock in the morning, 17 cups of coffee. That's all I want you to remember. If you put an 045 wire on that 10 o'clock position, remember that it delivered at 140 amps with the 035. This is the sweet spot now with 045. 
Unfortunately, the 045 delivers more current in the sweet spot. It delivers 190 amps, which is suited to 14 to 12 gauge. But I would rather have an 035 wire on there if I'm welding 16 gauge. But it's still 10 o'clock. So you see if it's a 1.2 millimeter wire or a one millimeter wire, it's 10 o'clock. Notice again, there's only three settings, very limited, uh, you know, very limited setting. But at the end of the day, yes, you can short circuit well gauge metals from 16 gauge to 12 gauge. But again, if I have a preference, I want to work with 035. If you're using RMD from Miller, you'd use the same settings. Start off with the same settings. If you're using STT from Lincoln, Lincoln calls it short circuit, but if you look through your welding shield and you, you know, you'll see pulsed, it's low pulse mode. And as it's a low pulse mode, you'll also be putting in peak and background current. But at the end of the day, yeah, you'll be around that 10 o'clock, nine to 10 o'clock settings with those those wires. Very important process now is spray transfer. I'm going to start you off again with the 0.9 millimeter wire. No pulsing here, just enough energy of current and voltage to make that wire, to create a magnetic field around the wire. So as long as we don't have more than 20% CO2, it will just come off on a stream. You've got 25% CO2 or greater, it won't come off in a controlled manner. I know a lot of places like in, in, in India and Africa, that you know, people are using the 7525s now. The bottom line is if you can get your distributor to give you 20% CO2, you will really get the best well quality. Sometimes you have to ask to get things. If short circuit was the morning shift, then spray transfer is the afternoon shift. It starts between one o'clock and five o'clock. If 210 inches a minute or 10 o'clock in the morning was the optimum setting with an 035 wire, then the optimum setting in the afternoon is three o'clock. You can't do better than putting an 035 or that 0.9 millimeter wire at three o'clock. The eighth turn, 560 inches a minute. You're welding 316 fillet. You want to weld a torque converter in an automotive plant on a high speed automation. You don't want too much heat. You want control. You stick an 035 wire on there at 560 inches a minute with a regular low cost CV machine, 15 to 20% CO2, you will produce the perfect wells. So we've gone from 10 o'clock to three o'clock. With that 035 wire, you have to be over 200 amps. So now you need that 250, you know, preferably a 300 to 450 amp power source. Because you can see at three o'clock position, you're going to be welding around 240 to 270 amps, where it's optimum. But you've got to be past 200 amps. And with power sources around the world, particularly multi-process power sources that give you poles or they give you stick welding and art gouging, they have different slope outputs and they don't provide this amperage that you get from a regular MIG machine. A regular MIG machine, not multi-process, is the best machine to have in a shipyard or in any manufacturing facility. But if you bring in a multi-process machine into that, because most of the people don't use them, they just set them up for MIG, at the end of the day, you will not get the same amount of current. You get slightly less current because it has something called a different slope output, which we can't go into here. So at the end of the day, the regular MIG machine is absolutely ideal. 
to get into over 200 amps with that one millimeter wire, I've got to be over 25 volts, not 22 volts, not 24 volts, over 25 volts. And it really becomes optimum minimum is 26, 27 volts. So remember that. So that two to three o'clock position there, that two o'clock I would use on uh, eight to three sixteen, three to, and the three o'clock position I would also use uh, in the one eighth to quarter inch range, uh, particularly uh, with robots. You can't get that spray unless you've got over 25 volts and you're over 200 amps. If you do a lot of welding and you find you're using an 0.9 millimeter wire and you're welding over 250 amps, you should be using an 0.45 wire because it is stable at over 250. It, it's in the spray range, it costs less and it feeds better. You get a typical car seat arrangement or, or something for a car and you're welding these normal 14 gauge and, and 16 gauge parts. Because it's a robot, remember a manual welder can weld at one speed, a robot can weld a little faster. So when I go to a robot cell, I always use a setting that's slightly higher than my manual setting because I'm going to be traveling a little bit faster. So on this car seat now, I've got a choice of short circuit, I could do a post or I could do a low end of spray because these wells are small. There's not enough time to create burn through. There's not enough time to create a lot of heat. When Volkswagen came out with its new Beetle, I was asked to go to the Mexican plant because they were having welding problems. That was, the, the wells were set up in Germany uh, at Volkswagen, but they found a lot of quality issues in the wells and they were having a lot of lack of fusion in the car seats. And um, I basically changed the German short circuit wells into spray wells at the low end with 035 wire. And um, that car was tested by the National Highway Traffic in administration here in the US that does crash test and receive the highest crash test rating that they've uh, ratings that they've ever achieved on small car seats but again simple it was just hey i'm going to use the low end of spray uh, spray goes 035 you know and i have to be past basically one o'clock so one o'clock is a six turn, six times seven is 420. I'm going to set up 450 inches a minute here, around about 25 volts. And it was as easy as that. No mystery, no big deal. There's information here on the start and the end data, always within the start to the end, staying within the optimum parameters. So you're not creating wire conditions which then influence spatter at the ends or poor arc starts. How many of you have seen a robot weld uh, erratic at the start and erratic at the end or creating, you know, or creating craters because people are not using these, this data. So when I'm welding, you know, uh, there at the three o'clock position, it's the, you know, eight turn, eight pounds an hour, eight to nine pounds an hour. I've instantly, again, with the robot, 30 minute arc on time, I'm delivering four pounds per hour. You know, it really makes it easy. You can see now that the, the travel speeds, the highest travel speeds possible is when you get into that one eighth range because you can't burn through. So we can have, you know, uh, small wells required. And one eighth, one eighth, one eighth, basically uh, around about a hundred foul. 
you can attain, I've attained speeds, by the way, up to 85 inches a minute with extended wire stick outs. That information is in my book, The Management and Engineer's Guide to MIG. But the most common wire used in, in whether it's India or whether it's in the US, when we get into wells over 100 power is the 045 1.2 millimeter wire. The video on the top left there is the transition when you're going between short circuit and spray and you're in good transition zone, you almost create a pulse like transfer, which is interesting because you'll find the optimum pulse setting is actually in the transition zone between short circuit and spray because the droplets are already occurring naturally. That's something that the weld equipment manufacturers didn't understand and still don't understand to this day. Short circuit or spray are spatter free modes. So when you when somebody comes in and say, well, I got this new pulse circuit, you won't get any spatter. You're only, and I would say, well, you're only getting spatter because you don't know how to set a MIG, the MIG parameters. If you set optimum parameters, the spatter is not an issue with the regular transfer modes. With 045, you have to be past that 12 o'clock position on the wire feeder. You have to be past 350 inches a minute because you have to get around 260 amps. 035, you had to be past 200 amps, the one o'clock position. So with 045, basically, we need to be past 12 o'clock. When you go into welding shops, you'll see a lot of scratch marks on the wire feeders around about one o'clock. Well, guess what? It's the sweet spot. It's the sweet spot. They played around with it and they eventually found a nice setting, but you didn't need to put a mark and you didn't need to play around with it. You just had to remember that one to two o'clock, 90% of all the wells in the world over 0 0.1, 100 foul, again, about 2.5, 2.8 millimeters are done from any thickness should be actually done between one and two o'clock. So basically from around 260, 270 up to about 350 amps, 1.2 millimeter wire, absolutely beautiful wells. And if you look at the welding bolts for this, again, you need to be over 25, 26 volts. So with 1.2 millimeter wire, you need 27, typically 27 volts is a good start bolts. And then adjust, if you've got a little bit of spatter, you increase the bolts. If the arc length is not creating any crackle sounds, you decrease the bolts. A lot of people don't understand that, that the sound, you want the same crackle sound in all MIG wells. MIG aluminum with pulse, with spray transfer, with short circuit, because <clears throat> with these spray modes, crackle sound is coming when the wire gets close to the weld and that stream is making contact with the weld and it's still making contact with the wire, it will explode and cause a little bit of crackle. And that's fine as long as there's no spatter. If the wire is driving into the weld, it's your voltage is too low. If the weld is not making any noise, your voltage is too high. And it applies to every MIG weld in the world, pulsed, aluminum, alloys, it doesn't really matter. Remember to get spray, you need to have your gas mix no more than 20% CO2. And then when you want less energy in a weld, you use less CO2. When I weld with stainless steel, I developed a gas mix in the 90s, 2% CO2. And that's another story because the welding industry, even today in North America, is still using the wrong gas for stainless steel. 
you want 2% CO2. But for most wells that you weld in your plant, you will be somewhere between 10 and 20% CO2. Now, interestingly enough, 20% CO2 is more energy than 10% CO2. When I do multi-pass wells in a robot cell on large two, you know, 50 millimeter steel, interestingly enough, I actually lower the CO2 content. Why? Because multi-pass wells build up heat. And then the fluidity of the, the weld and the oxidation potential of the weld is increased. So I actually, instead of using a 20% CO2, for example, on Caterpillar projects, I would go to 10 to 15% CO2. Because as I lower the CO2, I lower the voltage requirements. So I use gas mixes like that. You never need three-part gas mixes. Anybody that buys into, you never want a gas mix that puts oxygen in a weld. You never need a gas mix in MIG that actually typically puts helium into a weld. It's not necessary. You can get the energy by, by using these parameters we're talking about here today. I, you know, the one, the one thing I, you know, I, I think if you're welding 12 millimeter and less on aluminum, you're fine. I think if you were doing really heavy wall aluminum, you might want to put some helium in then, but then you would limit it to 40% helium because the argon is responsible for cleaning the oxides off the aluminum surface. So that's the only time I would even consider helium mixes. If you turn up the speed in a robot cell and don't touch the wire feed, the arc length will actually increase. If you turn down the robot speed in a robot cell, the arc length will decrease. So you gotta remember this, you, speed changes arc length. If you go a thousand miles an hour across the sheet metal, the wire will never be able to get close enough to the weld. So as you go faster, you actually decrease voltage. As you go slower, you increase voltage. And again, this is all very, you know, nobody should be operating a robot cell. No robot technician in the world should even be allowed to go into a robot cell unless they know this stuff. Otherwise, they stand there and they're playing with the pendant. And that's not what the person employs them to do, is to play around with controls. So all this stuff, which we don't have time to go into now, I've got to keep moving forward here. So again, I see two wells there, both of them in spray. Both of them, I instantly know this, the uh, voltage is too low because that wire is driving into the weld. The spatter window is too big. And I would normally go into those cells now and add a bolt. You'll see me on Link it every day I do it. Increase the bolts. That's all I'll say. I'll say, turn the bolt up, turn the bolt down. And I'll say it a thousand times this year and a thousand times next year. And I've said it for a thousand times a year for the last bloody 60 years but nobody's bothering listening. So when you see this type of a weld, if you walked up to the power source and just increase the voltage by one volt, you would see the spatter immediately come down. Remember, the spatter may not be going on the weld, but it's building up inside the nozzle. It's a control. Voltage is a control. Use it like a professional. So now we have pulse and, and I, I, what I've done in my, my, my whole content course is I provide basically every pulse setting in the world for every application on one, one PowerPoint. And you can look at the thickness and you can look at the part and you can instantly select the pulse setting. And if you want to use Hertz because frequency of pulses and adjust them for sheet metals, then that's available also. But what I've done here right now is I've just taken, okay, let's just look at pulse 
And you know, you're going to have a, a 1.2 millimeter wire on there. And by the way, you should be using 70S3 and not the 70S6, which all of North America uses, again, because of uh, marketing and salesmanship in the 1970s and 90s. I, I haven't got time to go into it today. Use 70S3. It's designed and developed for argon mixes. It will reduce the um, slag uh, oxides that occur on the surface of the world. And that's all I'll say about it for now. But the majority of the world is using the 70S6 wire with argon mixes. And that wire was developed for straight CO2 and therefore has too much silicon and manganese. And that's what creates the oxides. The whole of the North American and probably European automotive industry is using 70S6. And they're all complaining that when they paint or they coat, these slags pop off. And I say to them, just change your damn wire. But there's nobody in that industry can accept the responsibility of ownership to actually go back to the correct wire that was developed in the 60s and 70s for argon mixes. So we look at a pulse mode here now. We say, okay, 14 gauge, very common on, uh, you know, look at it, I'm nine o'clock. 10 o'clock, I'm one eight. 11 o'clock, I'm three sixteenths. 12 o'clock, I'm quarter of an inch. So I've got four settings there. Just basically, it's a different mode of transfer, but it's basically running from nine to 12 o'clock. And all I want you to remember is gauge, nine to 10 o'clock, thicker materials with pulse, 11 to 12 o'clock. Look at the voltages. There's no short circuit voltages here. You've got to you've got to create this droplet. You need the voltage for the high peak current. So we're running basically 23 to 26 volts. Okay, 24 volts. Any pulse make machine you go anywhere in the world today, gauge metal, nine to ten o'clock, 23 volts. Six millimeter to eight millimeter, 12 o'clock, 24, 25 volts. You've said it. Now, then you fine tune it. Then you say, oh, I need a little more energy. Go up on the turn. And remember, you won't see a clock on a pulse machine, but you remember a turn is 70 inches. Oh, by the way, with an 045, go up half a turn. It's a bigger wire, it's more effective. On an 035, a one millimeter wire, go up a full turn if you want more energy. If it's too hot, the same thing, go down. A full turn with 035, a half a turn with 045. But look again how simple it is. It doesn't matter how sophisticated that power source is. And that power source is asking for all types of information. What is it you welding steel or stainless? What is your gas mix? What is your wire side? And I say, that's a load of rubbish. I've got an 045, 1.2 millimeter wire on there. I'm going to weld pulse 18. I'm basically going to go in at 10 o'clock. I'll set that 210 inches a minute on that, on that control there. And I'll set that 23, 24 volts and I will be welding. So you see technology today, just like in your automotive, in, in your car is giving you hundreds of options. But at the end of the day, you still got to put your foot on the gas and your foot on the brake. And you got to fill the gas tank. We can make life complex. In this industry, we need to be keeping things simple. Now, I've also got a pulse wave mode where I can adjust hertz. Now, the, when, when we start to take the pulse and then we put hertz frequency, do, 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 or faster hertz, do, 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 whatever. That's good for sheet metal welds because it, it, it helps control burn through. I don't need this Hertz nonsense when I'm welding six millimeter stainless or Inconella steel, but this is good in the sheet metal range. So again, I provided this to you again, and uh, it's a good thing. Remember everything you start at, you look at the weld, you say, yes, I've started it. It's looking pretty good. I need a little bit more energy into that weld. Well, 045, we go up half a turn and then we fine tune the voltage. Always fine tune the voltage last. 
get the energy where you want, the speed where you want through the wire feed, the well size where you want through the wire feed, fine tune the voltage less. I've given you the optimum voltage. You won't be far away from it. One volt here, one volt there. So basically, you know, if you want, I've gone there nine o'clock to three o'clock, you know, um, and again, we go back and say the thin materials are in the morning before 12 o'clock and the thicker materials are on the right side. Now, interestingly enough, once you get once you get uh, into this higher end here with pulse, it tends to be erratic. A lot of people don't know this, but for 30 years, the pulse equipment manufacturers had a hard time. I used to go around this country switching all the pulse modes off. The transfers were erratic. You couldn't get a consistent droplet transfer so many times per second. It just, they didn't, they didn't understand it. The best power sources, you know, were things like this OTC and eventually Fronius. But the North Americans, for example, were very poor with the electronics going into the weld equipment. And the transfer, even to this day, is not that good. And as you go from one pulse power source to another, oh, this is not running really well. You got to remember this. Once you get over that one eighth, that three sixteenths to quarter inch wells. And quarter inch is the building block of all wells in the universe. Because if I've got to put in a 25 millimeter fillet well, I am going to do multi passes all about the size of a quarter inch fillet well. It's optimum. I've got the right amount of metal, I've got the right amount of energy, and I put stringers in. I never, never weave. And if I do weave, the limit is 12 millimeters. Weaving is too slow. It's no good in V grooves. It's fine for the cap pass, but I will limit the size even on the cap pass to 12 millimeters in width. Because once you go over that, you're going too slow and putting a lot of heat into those wells. So you've always got the option to weld the thicker materials with spray transfer if you're having instability issues with the pulsed equipment. And there is a tremendous amount of that. If you go to my website, weldreality.com, it's on the end. I've got 30 years of documented information, whether it's Miller, Lincoln, Hobart, ESAB, Panasonic, terrible, terrible problems in the plants. And basically the management in these plants didn't realize that the weld equipment was causing the problems. So we're getting there. We have better pulsed equipment today, but at the end of the day, like I said, it's in most cases, it's not necessary. So there's all the wells in pulsed for every application in the world. And I did that for the US Navy on the, uh, was that aluminum? Those are all the aluminum wells where I had to qualify to do repairs on frigates that were all damaged. I had to give them the whole range from 16 gauge to any thickness of the optimum wells, you know, and, uh, and that's what I, and, and it doesn't matter that I did that on an OTC. The pulsed is pulsed at the end of the day and those settings are good starting points for anybody. But you'll notice around about two to three o'clock, I've said, hey, you'll get better results if you go into spray in this area of the wire feed. A another sickness we have in this industry is people allowing welds like you see on the left side, where the welder is, is what I call skipping, stepping back and forth. And this is an old stick electrode method to avoid burn through on thin metals. It has nothing to do with MIG. And I hate to see this stuff because it shows poor management, poor training, poor education. 
That type of weld on the left, if you did a macro on it, would show poor fusion because you're taking the energy from the leading edge of the puddle where it should be and you're bringing it back over the top of the weld where it's not creating energy. So you will do a macro, you'll see like, never look at wells that have scalloped edges where you want fusion. The weld on the right is what I did with an 045 on a spray transfer robot weld back in, 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 in the 80s. And guess what? Two o'clock position, 27, 28 volts, 045 wire, 15% CO2. And you can't get any better than that. No spatter, no mill scale. Don't do wells with mill scale in the area. Mill scale is, 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 uh, takes the current away from the wire and it causes a lot of issues. Just run the grinder very quickly along the edges. I'm not saying remove the mill scale off the plate. I said quickly grind the edges before you weld. And that's the type of weld that you produce 20, 30 years ago. And the type of weld you can produce today with any 350, 400, 450 CV power source. So while we had short circuit at 10 o'clock and 17 cups of coffee, we now have, with an 035 wire, we have uh, three o'clock and 27 cups of coffee. If you had 045 wire, you would also have 10 o'clock, 17 cups of coffee. But if you had an 045 wire, you would go to one or two o'clock and 27 cups of coffee. So remember at the start of this, I told you, you can do all the wells in the world with two settings. I've just given you those two settings. Some basic notes there, aluminum, you know, different voltages. If you're doing pulsed aluminum, 16 to 18 volts. You're doing spray aluminum, 23 volts. There's the, you know, these are when you're using uh, 1.2 millimeter wires. Straight argon for all aluminum. If you need more energy on your pulse well, switch to spray. Use that 70S3 wire, not 70S6. Use 2% CO2 for all stainless. If you go above 5% CO2, you add to the carbon in the stainless. And try telling that to the welding industry, particularly over in the UK, where they're all basically using higher CO2 contents on stainless wells. 10 to 20% CO2 for all steel wells. 25% CO2 will not give you spray, but it'll do, you know, it'll do a good, it'll do a good well, but you will see spatter. So there's your notes there. I've come to the end of this workshop. I've still got uh, 40 minutes left for questions now. My contact is on here. My website, weldreality.com is, I started that website 30 odd years ago. And, and as a website, it's terrible today because it's oversized. I've never stopped writing for 30 years. There's too much information, but you can see the whole issue of the industry not using process controls and making poor well decisions and, and not using the proper parameters and all the evidence, the videos, and that is there. Um, my website, I have another website I have is called tiptigwelding.com. Tiptig is basically the evolution of the manual tick process into actually feeding the wire. Like you see, uh, it is, it's getting quite common today to feed the wire into the actual TIG arc. Tip TIG is a little unique in that it vibrates the wire so the droplet actually shakes off the end of the wire. And therefore with TIG welding now, you don't have to have highly skilled welders. You can put 300% three, more weld in each hour. Your weld joules is the lowest that's possible in the world because of EF polarity. And that's an interesting site to see all that type of information. Now, I don't know how I'm going to read your questions, or maybe uh, Inish could, could read out some questions for me and, and uh, what have you. Well, I'll try to do my best. So you, I need to give it back over to you, participants, and I need to give it back over to, uh, who do I give it to? Somebody help me here. Can you hear me?
Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Emily, sorry, there was a call that I was on, but this was a fantastic talk. And uh, I think years and years of experience just poured in. I hope all the uh, listeners had a really, really lovely uh, session and loads to learn from your experience. Thanks a lot. I would just see if Dr. Krishna is on there or not. And, so thanks, uh, goodbye. We were going to have some yeah, questions yeah. at this period. Yes, yeah, I think I'll just check. Dr. Krishnan? Yeah, there are a yeah, few questions in the Q&A box. Can you take them, Dr. Krishnan? Yeah. See, uh, uh, Emily, there is a question from Mr. Prakash Hegde. Why is it difficult to get satisfactory well finish of NICU7 model by GMW? Why is it difficult to get satisfactory well finish of NICU7 model by GMW? Not, you, I'm going to have to. I'm, I'm, I'm not too bad normally when I'm listening on Indian dialect, but I'm, I'm not getting, I'm not getting that question Look, very clear at my end. So can, see, uh, in the top of the, I mean, the screen, you will be able to see a Q and A. You can just click on okay. that. Okay. Uh, at the top of the screen. Are you able to see a Q and A window, small window? Oh, let me see. Do, do I, I see the dots here? Uh, show small active speaker video. Hide. What's this one here? No. No, uh, Emily. If you're working on a of a desktop, it may be at the bottom where you see the chat and the participants. Next to the participants, there will be a Q and A uh, box. Okay, I see. Oh, is it chat? Or... Yeah. Next to the chat, there is a Q and A question and answer. Okay. Okay. So can you write now? So you, what do you have to do? Do you have to type a message in there? Or no, no, no. You can, no, no. You can just take a question and answer your views. Yeah. Okay. I've not got question and answers. I've just got chat. Participants. Okay. Video. The question, Emily, I will repeat the question Mr. Hegde was asking was that uh, it is difficult to get good finish on Monel wires with GMAW. What is your experience? He's asking about monel wires. Monel, yes, monel. Let, let me let me tell you right now. You know, we're dealing with an industry here right now that can't do proper steel welding. <laughs> you know, if you want good finish on monel wires, then order your wires from Sandvik or from a controlled environment in which they have their own steel mills. But for questions like that, it's, it's not appropriate in this type of workshop. I mean, as I said, let's focus on, on trying to get this industry doing things right with simple steel wells and not worry <laughs> about Inconel and Monel. So let's keep the questions into the, the real world of welding here, please. <laughs> okay. I think his, his question was from the overlay point of view because they're trying to do a lot of overlay for oil and gas where they well, use then, GTAW. If, if, I, if I was doing it, let me put it that way. If I'm doing that type of whether it's, in, you know, and I, I, I've got a patent on Inconel and Monel for over a million pounds a year with the company. But the first thing you've got to start out with is you've got to look at your supplier of your wire. And I would not go to South America. I would not go to India. I would not go to Africa. I would go to Europe and I would go to Sandvik, which had the greatest quality system in the world, for example, for making wires. And I would still, you know, although they, I think Sandvik has sold that business today, you, you know, you've got to go to that type of reliable source. For you. We have Haynes Hastelloy here, for example, in the US. You get what you pay for in this business. And the trouble in the world today is, is you have all these wires available from around the world where there is no quality standards, not even for steel wires. It's awful. So start off by looking at the most reputable companies in the world. And if you have to pay a little bit more, 
who the heck cares? I told you your wire and gas costs are always less than 18%. So go to the reliable source. And then by the way, you wouldn't have to ask that question. Yes. Okay, so that, that's a good one. We will start with the wire and uh, maybe look it forward from, take it up from there. Dr. Krishnan, yeah. the next question. Yeah, see, uh, it's on, uh, do you recommend flux code arc welding mechanized way? If I'm going to weld on pipe right now, I have two choices. If, if I went for a job tomorrow to work on, and it was, uh, the whole shop was pipe welding. If the shop was doing monol, inconel, stainless pipe, I would have, I would want to do that. In the old days, we would do that with TIG. Nowadays, why would you do it with TIG when you can do it better with semi-automated processes like tip TIG? But at okay. the end of the day, if I'm going to also weld on stainless pipe today, I am not going to use pulse MIG in the 5G position. I'm going to use flux cord. And the flux cord, you know, is going to be probably made <laughs> in South Korea. It's because at the end of the day, stainless flux cord is one of the easiest ways to weld pipe. If I'm going to weld on steels, I'm not going to, for the fill passes on 5G position, I am not going to use pulse MIG if that wall thickness is thicker than six millimeter. I'm going to use flux cord. So I would use in the pipe shop, if the pipe was rotating and it was steel, I can do my short circuit wells first. Rotate the pipe, 10 o'clock position, 17 volts, 035 wire. And for the fill passes, 71 T1, 1.2 millimeter wire. Guess what? 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, 26, 27 volts. <laughs> simple. I have a flux cord course as well that does this the same thing. So yeah, when you want fusion and quality, you're not going to get it from pulse MIG. Once the parts get over six millimeter, you will occasionally find lack of fusion. You won't find that lack of fusion with the flux cord. You might find some slag and some porosity, but you won't find a lack of fusion, which is a much more serious defect. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, see, uh, there is another query. Uh, please share the link of the books and the relevant papers which are written by you. So you, you have got any link where you'll be able to find all your books and papers? It's on this, it's the last slide on this course. I, did you, did, did everybody manage to record this course? Yeah, we, we yeah. have a recording, yeah. So which we, if you look at the last you. slide, it's got the link there is the weldreality.com and you just go to the training resources for the books and the other programs, which is the flux cord and, and the MIG and what have you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. So uh, we have another one uh, regarding a groove weld plate with backing. So yes. uh, the thickness is five by eight inch. So the question is uh, with uh, GMW uphill progression, is it recommended to use 0.035 inch dia? ER70S3, 10 to 20. Yeah. It, many years ago, I, I went on a refinery site in Texas and they were rotating pipe and doing groove wells and, and doing the most beautiful looking wells you've ever seen. And when the x rays came back, the wells were flat, smooth surface. When the x-rays came back on these fill passes, when the pipe rotated, there was always lack of fusion. Now, let me tell you the number one issue with MIG welding is it's its deposition rate. Stick welding puts in a pound an hour. TIG welding puts in a pound an hour. MIG welding in a groove can put in 12, 14 pounds an hour. So you're always moving faster with MIG and you don't realize that speed doesn't allow the weld metal to often provide sufficient fusion. So when you're doing a quarter inch or a six millimeter horizontal fillet weld with MIG and you macro it, you'll go, yeah, it's all right. I mean, but it's not great. 
And that's under perfect conditions. That goes back to that deposition. So as a matter of fact, I like in groove wells to use the smaller wire, the 0.9 okay. millimeter, because I'm getting spray with a lower deposition. It's going to slow my travel speed down just a little bit. And I will actually get very good results. So to answer your question, we can use both wires, but at the end of the day, you've got to remember speed works against you. Right. And uh, we have another one, which is, uh, what are the different application area of spray transfer dip and pulsed? Spray transfer dip and pulsed. What is the difference between spray and pulsed? No, which are the application? Yeah, so different application for both of these techniques. Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, the whole world is going to pulse. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm. Why are we wasting money on this equipment? Why spend twenty thousand dollars on that Miller or that Lincoln Power Wave when I can get a, a Lincoln CV four hundred or a Miller Delta Well, two of the very good power sources here in the U.S., which used to be a lot cheaper, and uh, but they keep increasing the prices on those also. So at the end of the day, it's about it's about quality and consistency. To create a pulse droplet, there's a lot of electronic things have to happen during that well. You know, 60, 80 pulses, whatever percent. Blah, 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 blah. To create a stream of well metal in spray is nothing. Now, if I put an oscilloscope on a MIG CV power source, I will see the voltage and the wire feed is almost constant. If I put an oscilloscope on a pulse weld, I will see it going peak, up and down, up and down. So there's an inconsistency in pulse welding that sometimes you can see in the actual fusion in the wells. If I want, I just recently finished working on a, a tokamak uh, wells with Nitronic 50, a very sluggish stainless alloy. And I instantly qualified those wells with spray transfer. I didn't even want to do them with pulse. You know, so at the end of the day, yes, um, you know, you got to realize the welding industry in general is not looking at the weld macros. They're looking at the surface. And when you see all these pulse wells coming out with the cobots and the robots, yes, they all look nice. But the minute that fusion is a question, then I have a preference always to go back to spray transfer. Okay, yeah. So uh, we have one from uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar. How to reduce slag island, silicon islands on the weld bead? Get rid of the 70S6 wire that you're using right now or the 70S2 and go back to the wire. And hit, let me let a little, little story here. So in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, MIG in America was moving very fast. Everybody was buying MIG machines. Nobody was training welders on the process side. They played around with them. But whoa, this process was much better than stick welding. I mean, you can get the job done now. The wired argon mixes, although we're not available in, 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 let's say, in India or Asia or Africa, argon mixes were always available in the U.S. probably, you know, from the mid 70s and 80s. And when this happened, the MIG wire companies, especially the reputable ones like Lindy, you know, uh, I'm not gonna mention Lincoln at this time, but Lindy, for example, were really, really big in the US. They said, we need to create a wire because there's still a lot of CO2 being used in the US. We need to create a wire for the CO2 and we need to create a wire for the argon mix. And for the argon mix, the CO2 is dissociation. It's, it's, it's basically breaking much more oxi oxide potential. So therefore, the, we need to, with, the, with the CO2, we need to put higher silicon and manganese so that we can basically get rid of some of the porosity that's going to be caused from the oxide effect. And they created 70S6. And for the for the regular wires used with argon mixes, they created the 70s3. Now, in the, in, the, in the wire sales business, in the 1980s, to get the wire business, 
some wire manufacturing salesman would come in and say, uh, oh, our premium wire is 70S6. We will give you that, instead of you not buying our wires from any, us, us anymore, um, stay with us and we will give you the premium wire. For no okay. more money. And they, they gave those companies 70S6. And this is what happened in the automotive industry. And once the automotive industry, everybody took 70S6. It right. was sales. It was strictly sales and marketing approach. And people today go back to 70S3 and compare 70S3. Lincoln has a good L50 uh, product made from Cleveland. And, and look at these amounts of silicon and mangan uh, manganese in the wires. Keep it on the low level. And... Um, you will find you will dramatically reduce. As a matter of fact, the well that you saw uh, with the robot well before, that was 70S3. Where there is no, there is basically no silicon and manganese should be formed on most of those wells. Maybe a little touch at the start. So that's okay. the story of those wires. Yeah, yeah good one. So uh, now uh, for welding stainless steel, uh, currently being used is 98 2% argon. Earlier they were using 2% CO2. Yes. So yes. Which, which one is better? All right. Here's another. So I have lots of stories. Okay. Many years ago, I would be in the product marketing management role. Companies like Airgas and Arger and Lindy, Liquid Carbonic. And I would actually develop gas mixes. Now, in the 80s and 90s, the number one gas mix in the world for stainless steel was 90% helium, 7.5 argon, 2.5 CO2. It was the helium trimix. It was developed by Lindy technicians in a lab with short circuit welding back in the 60s. And what people didn't realize, and they said, yes, with this gas mix, we can make these sluggish alloys more fluid. But if people had read the, the paper, the research paper, they would have seen those Lindy people were welding one eighth material, three millimeter material. If you go to a sheet metal shop today that welds stainless, 16 gauge, 14 gauge, 12 gauge, 18 gauge, and ask them what the issue is with all your wells. They will say burn through, oxidation, distortion. And you say, what is the common denominator of those three issues? It's heat. And then you say, well, why are you using the world's hottest gas mix, which is 90% helium, which requires high voltages? And they look at you and go, oh. And then I say, you take the helium out. We don't need 2.5% CO2. That's just marketing. And we put 2% CO2 in. Now we weld it and we have lower voltages, less chance of burn through. If we use pulse to spray, the color of the wells will improve. There's less oxidation. All sheet metal wells are going to go blackish because at the end of the day, there's so much heat buildup. But Going to the 2% CO2 allows you to dramatically lower the voltage and it's fine. It's a great gas mix, a great gas mix. And every stainless manufacturer in the world should be using it and, uh, and probably also for in canals as well. Right. And in the same context, there is a question for welding of aluminium, is, uh, is it better to use argon gas or helium gas? Always argon. When you're welding aluminum, you've got to break up the aluminum oxide. The skin on the aluminum oxide is measured in billionths of an inch thick. You can scratch it with your nails and it will instantly heal. Its argon molecules are larger than helium molecules. And in reverse polarity, reverse electropositive, so those positive argon molecules are bombarding the negative surface. So at the end of the day, uh, MIG welding, TIG welding, stay with, your, uh, stay with your argon. Only if you're welding over 12 millimeters thick, 
I would hope you're not welding that with pulse, that you're doing it with spray. And if you're doing it with spray and you're still not getting enough fusion, then go get yourself a cylinder of 40% argon, 60% helium. That argon will provide the additional energy, but there's still sufficient argon in the cylinder to create the cleaning action. Right. So uh, there is another question. Uh, can we achieve zero spatters with uh, argon plus CO2? Pulse MIG welding of 0.45 inch 76 watt. No yes, spatters. yes, you can. Yeah, I, I've done, um, yeah, because I've done it for 60 years, literally. I've never had spatter issues. Spatter is about settings and voltage like we discussed here today. And... Um, you know, at the end of the day, when you're welding with MIG, if you extend the wire stick out a little bit, you're changing the parameters. And if you, you know, if you, for example, I'll give you an example. We can set up beautiful sheet metal wells for 12 gauge, you know, up to a hundred thousandths of an inch. And, but if the welder is moving his wire stick out because he's not keeping things constant, then all of a sudden you might get a little bit of globular transfer because you're not, your voltage has changed. You know, as you basically, go, as, as, you, as you change your wire stick out, as you increase your volt, as you increase your stick out, your voltage goes up. The minute you go over that 20 volts during the weld, you go into globular. So a lot of spatter welding on spatter is, is if you've got the parameters where they should be, and the welder keeps the wire stick out constant and he keeps on the leading edge of the puddle and he pushes the gun, always push about a 15, 20 degree forehand angle. Then yes, you can get spatter, you know, but at the end of the day, is there a tiny little bit of spatter there that you can almost just brush off with your glove? The answer is also yes, yes. Um, is that spatter completely going away with pulse it should do but most of the pulse wells that we see on linkage you'll see the voltages are not set correctly and when they're set correctly and particularly with robot wells with robot wells we shouldn't be seeing spatter because wire stick out is constant travel speed is constant but it, let me all all i will say this to you at the end of the day look <clears throat> If there was no pulsed equipment in the world, if there was no metal cord wires in the world, if there was no three-part gas mixes in the world, it wouldn't make one little bit of difference to the welding industry if they do things correctly. Yeah, great. So I will uh, take one last question, uh, Emily. This is from Mr. Spencer. See, uh, what he's telling is generally STT and RMD are used for the root pass of P91 pipe. Okay, so his question is, would GMAW short circuit serve the same purpose with the same root pass quality? It's a good question. You know, P91, all steels and all low alloy steels from a welding point of view, the parameters are pretty much the same. Now, if I was to use short circuit and the pipe was in the 5G or 6G fixed positions, this is what would happen. I would leave, you know, my normal gap, 2.5 millimeters to three millimeter gap. I would have a land, you know, 1.8 millimeter land over 116. I would put my tacks on those pipes at the 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock and nine o'clock. My tacks would be two inches long <laughs> to do it with TIG. So straight off, straight off. I've already welded the most difficult parts of the pipe. I would do those tacks, by the way, you know, um, hopefully with TIG welding. I prefer TIG welding for most tacks. But anyway, now here's the thing. If I have to weld 5G pipe with short circuit, I can start at the top of the pipe, short circuit, come down, vertical down with the gun, always pointed back at the weld so that the plasma and the arc force is holding the weld. And I would get down to just about before we get to six o'clock position. And then I would find, oh, 
damn it, the wire wants to go through the gap. And a, can, and a piece of wire might break off and stick inside the pipe. If I'm rotating the pipe, that never happens because I never get to that six o'clock position. I'm always welding around two o'clock with the pipe rotating. So on all pipes that rotate, short circuit is as good as RMD and STT and any other process. But when you go to the fixed position, RMD provides less for a given wire feed provides a little less current. And therefore there are less short circuits take place. And therefore when you get to the six o'clock position, it's less explosive. <clears throat> it's not as explosive. And then you say, oh, this is fine. However, good pipe welders with regular MIG know on short circuit in the 5G position, if you start to turn your nozzle around around the six o'clock, and point the wire feed back to the weld, you won't break through. So there is a technique and the, the STT from, from Lincoln is just basically, as I said, a low pulse weld. And most of the pulsed equipment today has low amp pulsed on it. You can also get very good 5G weld results from that. So again, if the pipe is rotated, regular short circuit is fine. Yeah, great. Yeah, Emily. There are, yeah, there, there are a few more questions which I uh, will be mailing you. Okay, you can. We've got 10 minutes here. Do you have 10 minutes left? Yeah, because the questions are longer. Oh, okay. Let me, yeah, let me see whether I can take one or two more. Yeah. I don't want to be doing too much on the mail. I think from India, I might get a thousand emails. <laughs> Yeah, you, uh, the awesome. kind of presentation you made, I think you'll get a lot of questions. Yeah, I can see one more interesting one. Uh, see, uh, uh, Mr. Muthi, uh, Muthialu is facing some problem while welding in machined steel casting using ER70S6. Okay. And uh, he is using 80 argon, 20 CO2. So he is asking, He's getting a lot of porosities. How to eliminate that? Well, the casting is, is the clue there that if I don't know if these are old castings and new castings. You know, it, the, the fact that it's a castings, there's always a potential for porosity. I will say this, that preparation in welding is much more than just having it clean. It basically remains, if you want, when I used to demonstrate wells around the world, I would always grind the edges of the sample plates. It didn't matter whether it was cold rolled or steel mill scale. I would always run the grinder off that because then I knew I had very little effect from the metals actually on the weld. And, yeah. and I will say this to you, you take that casting and you clean it, you wipe it down, you know, if, if, this, if it's been in yeah, lubricants yeah, yeah. or whatever, yeah. you use acetone, then you grind the surface of it, and then you put your bead on top of that surface. If there is porosity in that weld, it's coming from inside the casting. Mm, right. It's as simple as that. You know, it, it's just as simple as that. And therefore, you will never, the, the, the way to get around that then is if it's in a V groove with the casting, you put the weld in, it draws out the porosity. You grind that weld almost back out again. You put the next pass in. Now there'll be a little less porosity. You grind down again till you see no more evidence of porosity. And by doing that multi-layer, you are now drawing the porosity out of the base materials and you will end up with sound wells. But of course, it really depends on what that casting has been involved in. Okay, and uh, there is another question from Mr. Anthony, uh, which is on, see, what he's telling is there is a technology that has been introduced by OTC welding robot, which offers a synchronous feed, which lowers or eliminates pattern. Okay. You no, know, so I love that. I love that. I love this. I, I love that. You know, and, and it always makes me smile. <laughs> you know, in a few years, I'll be dead. And this, this is the message to everybody today in India. 
You yeah. have to get the salesmanship out of welding. You know, I love OTC power sources, but I've been getting spatter-free wells for 60 years. For God's oh. sake, and power sources that used to cost $2,000 for a brand new 400 amp power source here in America, no spatter. So if you use the proper data and you do what I've said in this session today, you will see no spatter. If you're getting spatter, in its spray transfer range, in the high end range, the wire, look at the wire. Is it running into the weld? If you're in pulse to spray, you have to keep a tiny gap from the end of the wire to the weld surface. So there's a bit of a crackle sound. But if it's a crackle sound with spatter, go over to your power source and add about a half a volt and have somebody weld again. Oh, that's a little bit, add another half a volt. All of a sudden, the spatter goes away. In the short circuit, if you see the spatter, basically, um, then you lower the voltage because you're creating a globular condition. So short circuit, slightly lower the voltage, spray and pulse, slightly increase the voltage. And then it doesn't matter whether you're in China, Timbuktu or Bombay, you will get spatter-free equipment as long as your argon mixes are 20% CO2 and less that's it and, and the materials so are clean you, you have given us a totally dis different perspective today <laughs> yeah it's so amazing yeah right. so uh, nimesh i think uh, we can invite malge our secretary for the vote of thanks yeah. yes mr malge yeah yeah i'm, I'm there okay uh, good evening everyone and good morning to emily uh, it was, uh, I thank uh, Emily for giving a, such an interesting and informative talk. And uh, this is a totally a different uh, type of uh, style of uh, presenting. And it was very easy to understand. Very good presentation with the colorful slides and uh, for understanding. And it was a professional talk. And uh, uh, covering uh, the various topics, wire feed setting, transfer modes, etc. Clock method is very, very innovative for show floor person. First time I heard the, of show, I mean, uh, the clock method uh, 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 operation in this thing. So is that I, uh, I really appreciate 12 hour session being comp compressed into two hours. Hats off to you, Emily. So I thank uh, again, Emily for giving fantastic presentation for the, our uh, participants. Uh, Thanks to all participants who attended from across the globe, uh, which make the uh, for uh, and I hope they have uh, taken a, a good note of the, all these things. Thanks to Dr. Krishnan and technical team for organizing this talk. I also thank our sponsors, Mr. Nimesh Shinoy of Sigma Weld and Electronic Devices. Thank you, one and all. That's all from my end, and uh, we'll conclude that this session is over. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Emily. Emily. Thank, thank you, you so much for your time. Next year, we'll Have do one day. on flux cord. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. That's, that's great. <laughs> that, 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 that'll be much more interesting. Flux uh, cord. Yeah. In the new year, in the new year, we'll do one on flux cord with the yeah. clock method. Okay, yeah, okay, okay, that's good. good. In fact, I was thinking to have the full 12 hour session, you know, split. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so what, You're killing me. All Indian <laughs> power contractors, we are now eyeing for you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic session I heard today. Really, it thank is. You so uh, much. And thank uh, you, by the way, for attending on a Saturday night. I know it's you could be home with your families, or you are, but thank you for taking the time on a Saturday for me, and, and I appreciate thank you. it. Thanks Emily, we had more than 100, and, we had more than 120 participants from. Across the globe, Excellent. I think maybe 10 countries or more. We normally have about 19 countries participating. So we will check the records and we'll know how many countries were there today. It's, it's good. It's, Thank hopefully you. Thank the, you. Message, the message will come out, I hope. And, and you, you've just got to try these things. You know, yeah. you've got the data. Go back now into your welding equipment and just do those settings. And you will see what I'm talking about. Yeah, Definitely. Right. We'll try yeah, that. Yeah. We'll yeah. Try that. yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.